Good morning. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful summer day. Nice to see you here today. I know we have one newcomer in the house. Welcome. We've given her a gift bag. Good to have you here today. And I think that's uh, all the rest of us are regulars, I guess. Um, we've got some folks on vacation and so on. It's summer, you know, and it's time to, we're just talking about it, time to seize the day and do those things and see those people you want to see. So thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Uh, and, and anyone vis listening in online, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, I always like to start with a couple of brief announcements, uh, just reminders of what's coming up here at the church. Next Sunday, um, Joe and I will not be here. We have a wonderful guest speaker and teacher scheduled to be uh, visiting next week, Dr. Michelle Harkey. Uh, she's got a fascinating background, and she's a very, very talented speaker. She travels around the country a good deal doing inspirational and motivational uh, uh, talks and presentations. So she's going to speak at the morning service on uh, finding purpose in challenging times and, uh, and, at, and do a workshop on the donation basis starting at noon, noon to about two, uh, on uh, finding your purpose by doing the, doing the work. Um, so it sounds like uh, that would be a really uh, wonderful message and, and a very inspiring message. Uh, okay, uh, women's luncheon is this week, I believe. Uh, it's Tuesday, August 1. Uh, August 1, is it August already? Yikes. Very fast this summer. At 12.30 at Scramblers. And uh, women of unity gather every month uh, on that first Tuesday. So newcomers always welcome. 12.30 at Scramblers over on Route 23, Lewis Center, uh, Scramblers. And uh, our weekly yoga class here is still on hold right now. But uh, Tamara is making progress in her healing work. And I know she'll be back with us soon. So uh, we'll keep you posted in our newsletter um, and, uh, and service announcements. And if anyone is not getting our weekly e-newsletter, you know, that kind of says what's going on this week, who's speaking, stuff like that, uh, do give us your email address and we can make sure you get that. Okay, and finally, just many thanks to everyone for your continuing support of the church. Donations keep coming in by PayPal or website or in our offering baskets here at the, at the church, and we are grateful for your support. All right, Joe and I are your musicians today, so he's going to come up, put his other hat on, his many hats. And we're going to do a lovely prayer song that we hope you'll join us on, very, very easy, called Open Wide My Heart by Lisa Ferraro, a beautiful song. <clears throat> Through us, 
we open up to the knowledge that that same spirit indwells us all, that abides within living beings across the planet. How grateful we are to know that in all circumstances, at all times, we are one with the living God, and we feel that presence with us as we open up and receive it. Thank you, God, for your unfailing presence in our very midst, now and always. Amen. All right. All right, we've got another song for you. It's by a wonderful songwriter, musician. He's visited here before, Tom Kimmel. Any of you remember Tom Kimmel? Wonderful songwriter. And uh, it's one of our favorites by him. Okay, it was right here. Thank you. Very much. You don't want to miss that. And it's called See Myself in You. Beautiful song. If I met you on the corner, would I know you as you are? Would I take you for a stranger and brush past you in the door? If you called me, would I hear you, or would I walk away too soon? If I lingered for a moment, would I see myself in you? <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good summer joke. <laughs> 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 
So here's the ones I have, you know, a couple. What, why did the first restaurant on the moon fail? It had no atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Outer space joke scene. Uh, let's see. Uh, what dance do all astronauts know? The moonwalk. The moonwalk. Okay, and here's a silly kid's joke. Why did Mickey Mouse go to outer space? To find Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> now tell that to a nine-year-old and you'll get a big laugh. <laughs> All right, talking about opening space. Uh, just kind of stumbling on a lot of really fascinating stuff about um, new research going on in terms of handling, managing conflict, conflict management. And, and it really kind of resonated with me and kind of dovetailed with a lot of other teachings about having to do with opening, <clears throat> opening up space. Uh, social psychologists particularly are doing a lot of research into the kind of divisive conflict um, that comes up in human life. And we've had a fair amount of it in recent years. Um, and so I was interested to learn about some of this research going on. There's, for instance, a place at Columbia University, some research going on in something they call the Difficult Conversations Laboratory, uh, where they intentionally uh, you know, kind of have controlled uh, difficult conversations uh, among people on different sides of uh, kind of hot topic sorts of issues. Uh, uh, that he said, quote, they intentionally generate the kind of discomfort that most people spend all of Thanksgiving trying to avoid. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and they're really looking into it, you know. Um, one of the researchers on that, Peter Coleman, I'll be quoting a little here, he has a book called The Five Percent. Uh, he says that about one in 20, uh, or about five percent of human conflicts get to this kind of level of conflict they call, he calls intractable conflict where it's like in, uh, kind of impervious to facts or reason or movement, uh, not listening, us and them, very tribal, very versus, uh, very divided, no areas of agreement, uh, no complexities, no nuances, uh, and, uh, and it becomes very set. And uh, it can be very dangerous because people in the group of that kind of conflict uh, are likely to do things that they wouldn't typically do. Um, and he says that the only common denominator with that kind of conflict when that's in place is that everyone loses. Everyone loses. Uh, and what's behind it is that people forget that human beings are driven more by their hearts and their guts than by their reason. Um, and so they've been kind of doing a lot of work uh, at figuring out uh, what does work to sort of diffuse conflict a little bit um, that gets to that level. How do we work with that? And they've come up with some really great uh, research that I think is beneficial for us all to learn more about, and it really dovetails very strongly with the teachings of uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, and the Buddha and any number of other spiritual teachers. It's about opening space. It's about getting past this set uh, uh, divisiveness and finding ways to open it up. Open it up. It's one of their primary teachings from coming out of this research is that what helps to diffuse uh, conflict at that level is uh, they talk about complicating the narrative. Complicate the narrative. It's a mediator by the name of Amanda Ripley who, who talks about that. By, that. by that they mean when you're in that kind of an intractable conflict situation, it's a very set narrative. Very set and very, it becomes very simplistic. This us or them thing, this tribal thing. Um, it becomes uh, very boiled down. All the little complexities in, of, of human beings and human life get kind of cast aside. All the nuances are gone. All the little uh, complexities of, of our lives and who we are and our relationships. So the whole idea is to make it less simplistic. Bring back in the contradictions, the paradoxes, the quandaries, the wonderings, um, and make it less shut down, make it more open. Open it up, complicate the story. It's not as simple as it seems. When you're in the midst of one of those things, it becomes very boiled down. Uh, would you agree? We've all had some experience with this level of conflict, I think. Uh, so I find it very helpful to think about this. So they have some strategies for opening it up, how to open the space up. Number one, these are real simple things. First one is ask questions. Ask questions, uh, be curious. Uh, don't leap to judgment or assumptions, start with questions. Questions invite reflection. They open things up a little bit. Um, Especially so open questions in the midst of a conflict. An open question like, what do you think, 
what, what's dividing us here? What do you think that is? Ideas might emerge that would open it up a little bit. Second one is listen more and listen better. Uh, in conflict, people want more than anything else to be heard. Anyone ever felt that? Above all else, we want to be heard. It's very, very basic. And very, very often, if a person feels they've been heard, uh, the conflict begins to diffuse right there. Sometimes the problem will even seem to go away once somebody gets heard properly. I remember that, you know, it's, it's in all kinds of, anybody that works with people, really, uh, any kind of role, it's certainly common in church work, uh, that a conflict will come up of some kind. It's, it's natural and normal for human life. Conflict is a part of human life. Uh, and sometimes it gets, you know, kind of elevated. Somebody will get very upset about something and need to be heard. Uh, I remember a time years ago, not this church, because I wouldn't tell a story about this church. <laughs> but years ago, at a prior church, uh, one of my uh, congregants who was in charge of the usher group uh, wanted to meet with me before uh, service. He was very upset about something. So I got there early. We had a little meeting, a sit-down privately, and talked. And it turned out he had a lot of, uh, lot of concerns about a couple of the ushers on his team who weren't doing their job. They weren't doing their job. They weren't meeting people. They were talking amongst themselves or to other people too much. They weren't paying enough attention. They weren't getting the job done, and he thought they should be fired. Well, we don't fire volunteers. <laughs> we never fire volunteers. Uh, and we talked for a while, and I, you know, and I, you know, I, said, I can see that it really upsets you, and I, you know, I, I know you take your job and what you do very seriously, and I, so I hear what you're saying, um, but we really can't fire volunteers. That's not what we do. We're so grateful for anyone who's willing to support the church and the many things we have going on here and our needs. So uh, anyway, we had a talk, and that was that. Never heard anything about it again. He was heard. And it was a lesson for me, and yeah, just, just to be heard is a powerful thing. And it'll often make a, an issue kind of dissolve right there if you get heard. So asking questions. Listening better, listening more. And this third one is kind of an extension of that idea with, with listening better. They advocate a strategy of, called looping, which is not a word I'd heard before. Maybe some of you have. I think people in mediation work are, are very key. They know these things very well. Looping is a technique for double-checking what you heard or what you think you heard in a conversation. Uh, so often we don't hear that well. We think we heard something, and it turns out that wasn't what somebody was saying at all. Has that ever happened to you? Very common problem. So that mediators will use this thing, looping. So, uh, and it's amazingly infect effective. Uh, even if it seems really obvious, you know, you, like I would, like I did with my head usher, you know, in that former church, I looped by saying, so you're telling me, I can hear you're angry, and you're telling me you don't feel these ushers are doing the job right. Is that correct? So I, that's a looping, it's a very basic thing, you just turn it right back, is that what you're telling me? Is that what you're feeling? And they go, yeah. Then they get the confirmation they've been heard. Looping, it's called. Um, and Amanda Ripley, who's the mediator who shared this idea, she says she uses it all, her time with, all the time with her kids in a real basic way, like you know, if her young teenager uh, doesn't want to go to bed, uh, which happened chronically for a long time, she said they used to fight about it all the time, when she began to use looping, in a very unremarkable way, she said she would loop back, so you're telling me you don't want to stop playing your video games and you're not ready to go to bed, is that right? Well, yeah! You know? <laughs> and now he just goes to bed then. He's been heard, and he goes on to bed, and they don't talk about it any further. He knows he's been heard, exactly what he was saying. It's an amazing little technique uh, we could use more of uh, when we're in that kind of conflict situation. So questions, listening more, listening better, looping, to make sure you, you're hearing, hearing correctly. And the fourth one I mentioned is widen the lens. Uh, if you're in one of these intractable conflict situations, look at the bigger picture of a situation. See if there's uh, some way of looking at this that's a little wider, that maybe includes us all in some way that we can focus on, that might be more beneficial than getting stuck down on this micro level. Um, she gave an example in her uh, article about oh, a little village in Vermont, I can't remember what it was, that they were going to use public funds, some public and, and some private funds, to uh, put up a new public art installation. And they, I guess they were advertising in the newspaper or whatever. Some people got really upset about it. They didn't like the, pub, they didn't like the art installation. They didn't think their funds, their public funds, should be used for an art installation they didn't want. Uh, and it got very angry, and it got very divisive. 
Uh, and somebody really smart on city council over said, you know, let's take a look at the whole thing about how we approve public art. You know, how do we make decisions about that? Who's involved in that process of selecting art for public viewing? And so it slowed it down. I think they didn't go ahead with that particular installation, but they came together with this wider lens. They widened the lens to look at, this affects us all. We all benefit from art. We all have some say in the kind of art we want to look at on our public grounds and use our public funds for. Let's spend a little time talking about that. Uh, that's very kind of diffusing of conflict. It's like, let's invite everybody to the table. Let's open it up, take a bit of a wider view. Well, this all you know, really fascinates me, and in part it's because it really echoes some of our, our, our great spiritual way showers and teachers. It's the same idea. Uh, Pema Chodron is one of my favorite, uh, she's a Buddhist nun, one of my favorite writers. She has many books out. Uh, the one that leaps to mind is one called Places That Scare Us. But her perennial theme is about how we get triggered by something. It could be something somebody says or something we see or something that happens to us at work or at home. And we know we get triggered and we begin to get, feel this inner flare up, you know, of uh, we've been triggered. And she, her whole teachings are about learning to catch ourselves in that moment and pause. She calls it the gap. Give yourself a minute. I think we do this instinctively sometimes. You ever, when you're feeling something, you just say, okay, I need to breathe. And you give it a minute. And it's kind of remarkable because all emotional energy will dissipate if we don't feed it, if we don't give it more fuel. All emotional energy will dissipate. And that's what she's talking about. It'll subside if you pause, if you give yourself this gap. Uh, opening space. You open space for it to diffuse. Jesus taught this again and again and again. He was a, a masterful conflict management specialist. I don't think we think about Jesus of Nazareth that way, but he was, a, he was masterful in what he demonstrated and what he taught about managing conflict. Probably his best known and least understood teaching about that is this one from Matthew 5. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of God, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? I get a punch out of that last part of it particularly, because a lot of us, we want to stay in that place. I only want to care about those who care back about me. Nice people, people I know, people I you know, are familiar with. Uh, not people who persecute me, people I don't understand, people who are strangers, I don't even know what they're about. Uh, and Jesus is saying, there's, there's really not much reward from just being, you know, loving yours, you and yours, you know, and leaving it just there. Not a lot of reward from that. And he's suggesting there are rewards, tremendous rewards, from learning to have compassion beyond that, uh, to love your persecutors, to love your enemies. Well, those, that language is, seems very surprising to us, but there's, I don't know whether any of you have read any uh, of the things out about his teachings in, from Aramaic. You know, his, the spoken language Jesus taught in was Aramaic, it wasn't a written language. Most of the people he spoke with were probably illiterate, but they, the Aramaic language was very rich. And the meaning of the words was multi-level. Uh, different meanings in different contexts, uh, sometimes multiple meanings in the same word. So as a writer, Neil Douglas Klotz, and he's got uh, several books on this, Prayers of the Cosmos or the Hidden Gospel, about the teachings of Jesus looking at the Aramaic. Um, how, what was he really saying at the time? And he said, love here, love your enemies. He, he, meant the, he said the translation of love here, uh, they would have understood, his listeners, that love here means a mysterious, impersonal force that acts in secret to bring separate beings together. Ooh, that's very different. Uh, it's not the touchy-feely love your enemies. It's touchy-feely keep your heart open. There's a mysterious energy at work that'll weave us together if we open to that, be aware of that. And pray for those who persecute you. The word pray there, uh, Neil Douglas Klotz says, means to open space for. Open space for those who persecute you. That's a tall order, but it's understandable, and it's really, it's all inner work, right? It's all inner work inside. I'm just gonna kind of keep an open mind, an open place in my heart, even for those I don't understand who aren't, who aren't treating me justly right now. Um, I'm going to keep an open space 
so that things can change. I'm not going to shut down and make it set it's us or them. I'm right, they're wrong. I'm not going to shut down that way. I'm going to open space. I'm going to pray for. I'm going to keep an open space for. It's amazing. This is going on all the time. Jesus demonstrated this really strongly. One of my favorite scriptures uh, where he demonstrated his conflict management skills is the one about the woman who's about to be stoned to death. She's caught in adultery. Do you remember the story? Uh, and he comes upon this dreadful conflict situation. Um, according to Law of Moses, Mosaic Law, you know, the, in the community, um, she was about to be stoned to death because of, her, uh, because of this. And a crowd of men were gathered. They were gathering up stones, this terrified woman in the midst, expecting to die violently, painfully, any moment. And this is what he comes upon. And instead of approaching the situation antagonistically, encountering, uh, the scripture says he crouches down and he starts to kind of write in the dust, gap, <laughs> took a pause, took a pause, and he just kind of uh, looked down. He didn't, kind of, he didn't even stare aggressively at anybody, he just looked down, sort of drawing in the, in the dust of the earth for a while. He gives it a few minutes, pause, a gap there, and then the idea comes to him, let the one among you who is without sin cast the first stone. Now, original meaning of sin wasn't the heavy baggage word we have now. It was more like missing the mark, making mistakes. And his listeners would have understood that. So what he was kind of doing was widening the lens. Haven't we all made mistakes? Let the, is there anyone here who hasn't made a mistake? Uh, let them be the, the, the one to start this. But haven't we all made mistakes? That's like he widened the lens to include everybody. Yeah, we can all understand it on that level. And they all peel off. They all wander off one by one until it's just Jesus and the woman. Uh, and he says, is there no one left to accuse you? And she said, no one, sir. And he said, neither do I. And the conflict was diffused. Masterful management of that conflict saved a life. Didn't change that unjust law. Didn't transform his culture and make sure that problem will never happen again, no. But it diffused that, that conflict situation that could have been terribly dangerous, definitely saved that life. And I think that kind of technique, that kind of opening space for, um, that kind of listening and asking and reflecting and keeping your heart and mind open, these kind of widening the lens, I think these things can save lives among us all the time. I think it's powerful stuff. And I think it's going on all the time. I, uh, in, I think it was Amanda Ripley's work, she's a mediator, she told this story, I'll just, I'll just end with this, about a, an amazing bus driver in Portland, Oregon, um, who, his name, is Dan, his name is Dan Christensen, and he's a public bus driver in a major, large city, Portland, Oregon, and uh, he's interested in, maybe because of his job, he's interested in conflict, and managing conflict, and so he's read books on it, and he's developed some techniques and so on, because believe it or not, there's a fair amount of conflict that arises on our public buses. Does that surprise anybody? <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. I uh, lived in New York for a while, took the bus every day to work. It's, uh, yeah, people get a little hot under the collar about things, so he has to deal with that in his daily job. Um, in fact, he, you know, he kind of knows what he's dealing with. Uh, he has a pretty strong sense of it. He says, I just assume every day that I'm the only one who's unarmed and I'm strapped in. It's like he's, he's ready, he's got his techniques, uh, he's, uh, he's prepared to interrupt conflict if it comes up. So he, these are his techniques, and I think these are things we can all do in a way, and it's the same things coming out of the difficult conversations laboratory at Columbia University uh, on a public bus in, Bo in Portland. As soon as someone comes on the bus, every, every person that's on his bus, he greets warmly with a smile, with a smile, hi, how are you, and smiles. Uh, even during the pandemic with a mask on, he said he always smiled when he greeted people because people know if you're smiling behind your mask or not. And it's true. It changes your face. It changes your voice. Uh, how are, so he's greeted everybody as a person when they get on the bus. I see you. Good morning. How are you? You feel different when you, when you re responded to in that way, when you greeted in that way. Then when a conflict erupts, when something happens behind him in the bus, this is his methodology that he, uh, calls it two questions and a choice. First thing he does is pulls the bus over and he opens up all the doors uh, because nobody in conflict wants to feel trapped. Opens up all the doors, very smart. Then he gets on his intercom and he does the first question. He pulls up, he, uh, gets on the intercom, he says, okay, what happened? 
not what's the problem, what's going on here, but what happened in a kind of non-judging way, open, wanting to know what's happened. Uh, and that kind of, the question throws people a little bit. Questions open things up, they don't shut things down. So people kind of hesitate a little bit. And then finally somebody says, whatever the conflict was, well, I wanted the window open and he didn't, you know, or he took the seat, I always sit down, whatever the conflict might have been. Somebody talks about it. Uh, and so then he loops them. He loops them in some way. Uh, I can tell you're angry about that. You've lost your seat. I, I, I can sense you're really angry about that. I hear you. Person gets hurt, looped. And then the second question, what do you want me to do from here? He'll say, uh, he says, you know, I could report this, I could call it in, and we, we can go that way, uh, so I really would have to. Um, or you could come up and talk to me, and we could get going again and let everybody get safely to where they're going. And that's usually what they do, because they've been given an out in a difficult situation, in a, in a kind of kind way, a non-judgmental way. Uh, and that's what happens. He offers them a way out, come up with me, I'll, be, I'll listen to you more, we can talk about it more up by, while I'm driving, and everybody gets to go on their way. Very powerful and very basic practice. Uh, questions, opening space, widening, he widened the lens a little bit toward the end there too, didn't he? We all want to get somewhere safely today. We're all on the bus, want to get home safely. Uh, powerful techniques that I think we can all do when things come up in our lives. Personal conflicts, larger conflicts, Instead of going to the kind of the knee-jerk reaction of very definite sides and we, we, are, we can't meet anywhere in there, remember the complications, the nuances, the things that are always changing. We can open a little bit. We can keep a little open space in our hearts and minds. Uh, it doesn't mean we're going to change everybody or uh, change our culture you know, like that, but we can diffuse conflict a good deal. We can open things up so that maybe some common ground is found. We all want to get home safely. Uh, we all want to feel good. Um, we all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. Uh, those are techniques we can all use every day. And our, our spiritual teachers have been advising us to do that from the get-go because everyone loses in a conflict where there's no connecting, where there are no nuances, no complexities, and no understanding. Uh, I take that to heart today. I feel like I've been kind of given a little bit of a, uh, an arsenal of some things to work with. Uh, in divisive times. So let's take that in prayer for a closing moment if we could. Affirm that power and presence within us that makes so much possible in our midst as we open to that, that presence from within, that presence that is love, that is peace, that is wisdom, as we invite it to flow through us, as we pause and open in ourselves to that higher intelligence, we will be guided in the path of peace, of freedom, of abundant life. Thank you, God, for your unfailing presence within us and in our midst. Amen. All right, we got another song. Uh, this is about opening up in a way, I yes, think, and uh, being open to one another. It's a song by uh, Peter Mayer, who's also visited here. Some of you might uh, know Peter Mayer's work. He's a wonderful songwriter out of Minnesota, and uh, we do this song from time to time. It's a good one, and it's a very easy chorus. I want y'all to sing along, okay? Hold everybody in. Sometimes a circle is a class or a creed. Sometimes 
but the circle is made of only men. Until Susan B. Anthony said, what about me? Let me in. Let everybody in. Everybody in. Everybody in. Everybody in. To the circle.